Welcome to session five of Basics of Biblical Archaeology. It's good to have you with us. We're going to look today at the site of Megiddo, an extremely important city in the ancient Canaanite world, a powerful city, one that guarded the road that takes you from Egypt all the way into Mesopotamia. We know of Megiddo a little bit in the Bible, especially from the prophetic parts of the New Testament, where it says that a great battle is going to take place in the future in Megiddo. And that battle is going to be between Jesus and the forces of the world, the nations of the world and their armies, uh, who will be opposing him. But that Megiddo has an earlier history in the ancient world. So we want to look at that site of Megiddo, both as a Canaanite site before the Israelites got there, and then with the time we have at the end, we'll look at a little bit of uh, the site during the time of the Israelite period. So where is Megiddo located? Let's look at the map and then the mound that uh, consists of the site of Megiddo. So this is an Israeli map, and it's different than most maps that we would look at because it's not north-oriented, but it's east-oriented. And the reason for that, of course, being that for the ancient Israelites, when they think of where things begin and where things start, it's always in the east because Israel is located to the to the west of Mesopotamia, and of course, civilization begins uh, in uh, the east as a direction from where they're located. So for that reason, they put east at the top of a map, and, they, and therefore west is at the bottom, and I have a W there. A S for south on that end, and then and, and this position is the north. So that being the case, we have the Sea of Galilee here. The Mediterranean Sea, it's not marked as such, but the Mediterranean we see a little bit of it here. And the Dead Sea, which we know is there, and of course what connects the two of these, uh, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, is the Jordan River that flows um, into it and dumps into it. And of course, this area here is the lowest point on Earth that you can go without being permanently underwater. So it's an extremely hot and arid place. Now, um, we have four um, sections of the... Um, land of Israel and its environments. Um, they're, they're divided into the coastal plain. So this area along the Mediterranean Sea is known as the coastal plain. And of course, it's broken up a little bit here by part of Mount Carmel. Um, and then we have a, a region that's slightly between them, like right in here, we have the Shvela, that's like the lowlands. And then we have um, this area here, this is the hill country, which runs, of course, and all of this is north to south. And then we have um, this area here known as the Jordan Rift Valley. And it goes all the way from the south in, uh, to Mozambique. And it comes um, up Africa all the way through the Sinai, um, through the land of Israel on its eastern border. And then it continues all the way into Turkey to the Amanus Mountains. So this is one of the longest fault lines in the world. That's what's underlying this rift. And this fault line is known as the Afro-Arabian fault line. So when you see in the Bible that there are earthquakes that are happening, there's a reason for it. And that's because it's sitting essentially right on a fault line, a major, one of the Earth's major fault lines. Uh, I lived in Los Angeles and Orange County for 10 years. And I know what earthquakes are like. I was literally four city blocks away from uh, the Northridge quake of 1994. And that just shook us to death. Uh, just about, and we lost all power, and we lost everything in our kitchen, and so forth. So earthquakes can be very traumatic, and there are times in Israel's history when it experiences uh, devastating earthquakes too. Well, we want to look at the site of Megiddo, which you don't actually see on the map because I, it's underneath this area I've outlined in a, a purplish, bluish color here. This is called the Jezreel Valley. Uh, there are different places in Old Testament history, especially you'll read about something happening in the Jezreel Valley. Um, Ahab, King Ahab is in, and Jezebel, they're involved in events that go on in the Jezreel Valley. Elijah's involved in such events. So that's the Jezreel Valley, and essentially that's the valley where this future battle will be. It's not just at the city of Megiddo, but it's in this uh, Jezreel Valley where the Bible says that the the blood will be so high at that time, it will be up to the horse's bridle. So that's the place. Now, if we're going inland, then 
um, we can, for example, um, pass through the, the, the you know, we can move off of the Mediterranean Sea and onto the plain of Akko and follow it uh, without having to hike uphill too much into the Jezreel Valley. And then we can keep going all the way through the Jezreel Valley uh, to this point in the Beit Shan Valley. And of course, Beit Shan is the city of Beit Shan is, is right in here. And that essentially gets us a straight shot into the Jordan Rift Valley. So it's a very, um, more or less, it's, it's a more or less flat trip uh, there. So you can see that that passes right through the Jezreel Valley. And so this is one of the places where um, Megiddo would be overseeing what happens here. And then Megiddo is located in a very important position because the, um, the international highway that passes through Canaan passes right through Megiddo. And that we know of in Old Testament times as the Great Trunk Road. And in New Testament times, we know it as the Via Maris, which means the way of the sea or the road of the sea. And that's in Latin, of course. Um, and that's suggesting exactly what you'd think, that it's a, it's a road that more or less hugs or is parallel to uh, the sea. And in this case, it's the Mediterranean Sea. So this is the area where Megiddo is located. And now I've shifted your look here, even though this is another Israeli map. I've allowed it to be north-oriented, so west is on the left. And that, that uh, road I was telling you about, that international highway, the Great Trunk Road, it passes up here, and you can take one of several paths. Your ultimate goal is to get through the Jezreel Valley here and get into um, the Jordan Rift Valley, which is down in here. So there's the Sea of Galilee. And then from that point, you just follow it uh, eastward or northeastward until you get to uh, Damascus and other cities of Syria. And then you can take that, of course, all the way into Mesopotamia. So this is the really important travel route to get you from Africa to the heart of the Near East, or nowadays, as we would use the term, the Middle East. All right, so where's Megiddo? Right here, I have it in green. So if you were to take the, uh, the International Highway, the Great Trunk Road, you could go one of several directions to get to the, where the road is on the other side of the Jezreel Valley. You could go along the Tanakh Pass or um, the Jokneum Pass here. Or uh, if you go through the Ar Arunas right here, if you go through the Aruna Pass, as soon as you come out, you'll get to Megiddo. So Megiddo is located as you come out of this pass and into the Jezreel Valley. So Megiddo is at a strategic point because it's guarding all the flow of traffic coming this way and going to Beit Shan, and there's Beit Shan. So all of the coastal traffic would go uh, near Megiddo, so Megiddo would oversee it. And of course, the main route for the uh, Great Trunk Road is right along Megiddo here and then through the pass. So you can see that right away, Megiddo is an extremely strategic city. And it, for that reason, it was the guardian of um, the international travel. And it was constant that Megiddo was um, um, under duress because people would be traveling through Megiddo um, and, and because of you know, trading issues or whatever, there would be conflicts. And so um, Megiddo was constantly destroyed and it was uh, rebuilt. So it was one of the most rebuilt cities in the land of Canaan, without a doubt. And there's just stratum after stratum, level after level of occupation because of the um, destructions of the city that took place and the, um, the capture, the conquests of it. All right, so that's where Megiddo sits. And this is just to give you a little bit of a feel for, for um, the Jezreel Valley, um, looking at its lush greenery probably in a spring season when the photograph was taken. And you can see, of course, the rising hills in the area. So there are plenty of uh, hills and low-lying mountains around it. This is another shot of the Jezreel Valley with Megiddo in the foreground. So if you want to know where Megiddo is in relation to all of this, it's right here. This is the site of Megiddo. You can see the palm trees coming up here. And you can see the sand color as a result of a lot of the activity that, that goes on over there as well as the um, excavation, especially, that takes place there. Because it's, it's not currently inhabited. Some ancient sites are currently inhabited. Other major sites um, that where digging is done or where we would want to do digging, there's a modern city. And that makes it much more complex to be able to 
um, dig exactly where, where we want at a site because of modern um, communities that have landowners and businesses and so forth that um, own and control property there. So now we're getting closer, we're zooming in on this, the site of Megiddo and again you can he see it here in the center of the screen. It's a beautiful site, it's up on a nice hill, it overlooks the valley, has a great view of the valley and in ancient times it would have been a wonderful place to live there without a doubt. Now we're even closer, almost overhead, not exactly overhead but maybe a f around a 45 degree angle or so and so this is an aerial view of Megiddo looking toward the south from here. So this already now allows us to see some of the excavation. There are uh, squares here where digging has been done, here, 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 etc. So lots of places on the site where digging has taken place already. And you can see in this area where a trench was dug out that there's a lot of um, excavated material in this area, extremely thoroughly uh, excavated. And then this is more or less an overhead view just allowing you to see some of the areas where we can define as uh, connected to certain times in ancient history such as Area F here. This is Middle and Late Bronze Age. So Middle Bronze Age is around 2000 BC and then after that Late Bronze of course begins in, um, in 1560 or so BC. This area here, Area L, this is Iron Age II, and of course that is the heart and soul of the Israelite monarchies, Iron Age II period. Um, and so um, we think that there are palaces and stables there. And then Area J, this is early Bronze Age temples, and so um, there's important activity uh, in the lifetime of Abraham and before the lifetime of Abraham especially in the early Bronze Age, and that activity goes um, back to... Um, these temples where worship was already taking place on the site and of course it was the worship of pagan deities. Area K over here, this is the Late Bronze Age, Iron Age I material. Area M here, um, monumental architecture from the Late Bronze Age, plus tombs and an Iron I palace. Then Area H down here um, as well. So these are some of the areas on the sites and again there's so many parts of Megiddo that have been excavated. It's not just uh, where you see the arrows but other places as well. But these are some of the areas of, of the main excavation done. Now we want to just take a moment to look at a model of the site of Megiddo. This is essentially a reconstruction of what it would have looked like back in ancient days. And if you go to the site of Megiddo today you can actually see this model for yourself. Uh, there's an enclosed building where this model sits and allows you to be able to see various sites, uh, various areas on the site and then gives you the opportunity then to prepare the trip that you're going to have onto the tell and view various um, landmarks and various things. So we see that there's this city wall all the way around Megiddo and we see um, very important uh, structures here demonstrating um, the, the influence and the, and, and the wealth uh, within the city of Megiddo. So this is a very formidable city in ancient times. The ramp here coming up to the gate area of the city and allowing you access within. And unlike some cities in the ancient world, um, it was very well inhabited throughout uh, the entirety of the city. And that's because it was at the crossroads. This is a, uh, an extremely important site and one that um, controlled a lot of territory. He who controls Megiddo controls a thousand cities. Again, looking at it overhead, these are a couple of the other areas for excavation. Area AA, Area DD, BB here, and CC here. Uh, and this is the area of Schumacher's Trench. Back in the earlier days of excavation, the archaeologists often just dug trenches where they would literally get out there with backhoes or the equivalent and, and they would just um, go through ground at, at light speed um, trying to get down and find um, you know, treasures and things of imp they would view as, as of importance. And so archaeology has evolved a lot since then. It's a lot less um, rugged and, um, and brutish. It's a lot more careful and exacting in our day. So um, 
and I'll quickly go through a little bit of the early history of Megiddo from its inception when the site was first occupied until the um, early Bronze Age III in the third millennium BC, uh, late in the third millennium BC. So, th so essentially this is the time before 2250 BC. Um, this is known as the Great Trench and obviously you can see what kind of work took place here to go that deep in the tell and just gouge out material. So this is, most of it is lost material that we would otherwise be able to study at a greater depth. But it is what it is. And, and, and in this trench, they found um, various settlements in the history of the site from the site's finding. And in this area, um, they went all the way down to um, what's known as the pre-pottery Neolithic age. So that's uh, in, definitely in greater antiquity. And, um, and then there was settlement after that in the Calcolithic period, and then moving on into the uh, Bronze Age. This is uh, a little bit of the city wall, and it's in black and white, so I apologize for that, but it shows us still with a man standing here, the perspective. And you can see how far down it is in the trench, showing you how much the site has, has uh, increased in, it, in, the, in the level of um, its... Um, it's fill since then. So at, at this point in, in the third millennium BC, this would be part of the wall that was built so it was much more low lying. Um, undoubtedly the wall would have extended higher. Uh, it's just that only this much, these you know, four or five, six courses of it have survived and the rest of the wall above hasn't. So this is roughly in the time period I would date personally 2550 to 2350 BC. This is stratum 18 at the site. And this is part of the area where there was a lot of important religious activity that took place again in the Canaanite period before the Israelites ever come. So what stands out to you probably is this circular structure here and this is a, an altar. And exactly as you would expect there were animals that were sacrificed on top of this altar. There were um, uh, around that altar there were temples built at various periods and the altar was actually used over the, the course of several um, phases of, of the earlier archaeological um, period here at Megiddo. So um, you can't really confine it to just one period but it shows up as early as um, before early Bronze Age 3. So here now we're closer to that altar. You can see the stairway right in here leading up uh, so that the priest or whatever could take the animal up and, and um, make the uh, sacrifice on top of the altar. So the altar was surrounded by what's called a temenos wall with an enormous amount of animal bones and potsherd found between the altar and the wall, undoubtedly the remains of sacrifices that were offered up on the altar. And the altar was built near an early undiscovered temple. So the earliest temple that would have been in this area during the use of the altar has yet to be found. It's possible that that temple will never be found. It could have been um, completely leveled and then the building materials were used in a later phase uh, for rebuilding. So that's one of the problems archaeologists face. Important objects that, are, that, that would be discoverable at a site are not discoverable because the ancients themselves after that period would have robbed out the material to use on building something else. Now we move to the early Bronze Age III, roughly 2250 to 2100 according to my dating scheme, my preferred dating scheme. And this gives you now an overhead look, a drawing. And remember that altar that we saw, that round altar? There it is. It's continuing in use in the uh, early Bronze Age III. And now we have temples that are built on a larger scale that work together with the altar. So we have one here, one here, and one here. So um, these rooms, the ones that are preserved the best, uh, this is almost certainly the Holy of Holies in this uh, temple, and this as well, and this one too, Temple 4040, 5192, and 5269. So they had stone walls. Uh, there are parts that have been restored around them because we know what would be there if it had been preserved, but not all of it ends up being preserved, so we can only study what's preserved and then we have to kind of um, recreate what it would have looked like uh, beforehand based on what, um, what's been left there as the remnants. 
The floors here were made of lime, so probably um, there was a plastering involved inside the temples. Um, this is the early Bronze Age three temples that are by the um, round altars, such as Temple 4040, located right here, and then Temple 5192 um, in this area. So they were preserved to some extent, and you can see they're, they're very deep on the tell. You know, if you were standing at the tell in modern times, you'd be up here. So that's very far down, showing you um, how long ago it would have been um, that the people were down at that level. So now we're going to look at Middle Bronze Age 1 and 2A, which basically uh, deals with the range of 1850 BC to 1750 BC. And this is stratum 14 on the tell. It consists of buildings that were small and poorly constructed. So this suggests that there was um, a movement or uh, the death of most of the people at the site beforehand, and probably other people have come in and settled the site. And, and basically, this is the beginning of, of a new occupation. Most of the pottery from this level that was published dates to Middle Bronze 2A, while most of the architectural remains date to Middle Bronze 1. And what that suggests to us is that um, Middle Bronze 1 with the architecture is where the basic rudimentary parts of the occupation were set up, buildings with their walls and, um, and structural features. Um, and then it was used in MBA 1, and it slipped into MBA uh, 2A, and uh, it was continuously occupied, and now we're um, looking further at the material culture and um, seeing um, pottery uh, of this period of the MBA 2A, suggesting that probably the people who had lived earlier, um, all of their, their wares and, and so forth, had made their way to the trash dumps. And so the, the next uh, occupational um, phase features um, the material that was of, of the second phase of occupation um, at this time. So there was a massive city wall of early Bronze Age levels that went out of use during this phase. And that's significant because it shows you there's a, a lack of a, a civic defense. These are people in a very rustic set, setting or um, in a position where they can't defend themselves. So it's, it's kind of a different day now with this stratum 14. And there are also remains of weak fortifications found above the old wall. So that suggests that they did try to fortify um, their site to some extent, but it doesn't seem as though it was extremely effective fortification because it's poorly preserved and it's, uh, it's not extensive. And it suggests um, that this is um, essentially an occupational um, group of people in dire need. There was a round, uh, this is the time that the round altar also seemingly went out of use. And so what that suggests is that there were other places on the tell where the worship and the cultic activities took place. So um, they, they decided it was time to upgrade and probably new temples were, were built as well as um, a new altar. So stratum 14, it's a very humble um, occupational phase at the site of Megiddo. Then there's the majority of the period uh, of the Middle Bronze uh, 2A, which is roughly 1850 to 1750. So jo um, just to give you perspective, Jacob has died in 1850 B 1859 BC. So we're talking about, again, the numbers here are rough, but roughly nine years after Jacob dies. So that's the equivalent of what's going on here at Megiddo um, with the Israelites down in Egypt. So during this part of the Middle Bronze Age 2A, we have a new city wall built, and it has offsets. And so that means that instead of a straight wall going along like this, you have, um, well, you have offsets. So I'll just picture it like this. Um, you, you, you have, um, you know, this kind of thing, where there are sections of the wall that kind of zigzag like this, um, and that is for defensive purposes. There are ways that you can get more bowmen up there and so forth and become more um, adept at knocking off attackers. So there are reasons for an offset wall. Um, but that was built just to the west of the early Bronze Age wall. And then there's a row of homes that was built on a lane parallel to the city wall. You have buildings of stratum 13 here that are better constructed. 
than those of the early Bronze Age. So now that we're into um, Middle Bronze Age 2A, we're starting to see uh, probably the people becoming wealthier and definitely expanding their construction and so forth. Um, material from stratum 13 is found in areas AA and BB. We saw where those are located on the mound earlier. Megiddo's oldest excavated gate is found in area BB. Bronze statuettes were found on the pavements and they belong to a bema, to a, a high place. And this, of course, is where worship activity was done and, of course, God has constantly uh, or, la or later would rebuke the Israelites for continuing the practice of worship of pagan gods at the high places in Israel. So high places like this and other places around Israel, Israel were preserved into the Israelite um, occupation and then, um, and then were used by them um, erroneously. Um, we have the Tuthotep inscription in a secondary context, which was found belonging to an official of Sesostris III and whose title may mean that he was a governor in Canaan. So it's possible that this guy, Tuthotep, uh, was a, um, a, a mayor or a regional uh, ruler here in Megiddo, perhaps representing the Egyptian crown. The fact that this is connected to Sesostris III is important because Sosostris III is the famine pharaoh in Egypt at the time uh, that this is going on with Tuthotep here at Megiddo. Now we move into Middle Bronze Age 2 B and C, roughly 1750 to 1560 BC, um, and we see more wall. This is the city wall of the Middle Bronze Age 2 A that was used um, also in the Middle Bronze Age 2 B. So. What's characteristic of this time? Well, the Middle Bronze Age 2A levels at Megiddo are equal to strata 12, 11, and 10 that have been excavated by the archaeologists. Um, there are differing plans for stratum 12, and that suggests that there was a cultural shift. So at this time, with um, the, the latter part of, of Middle Bronze Age 2A, we have probably a different people who have come to the tell to reside there because of the cultural shifts that we see in their architecture and other things. The city wall was doubled by a skillfully built addition. There was a glacis built on the outside line of the city wall, and a glacis essentially is a slope that's built. Let's say you have a wall here, and you have a slope that's built here, um, and that slope uh, would be an earthen, earthen rampart and oftentimes it was plastered so that it would be smoother and easier um, um, material here, but it then um, allowed for the people who were um, making the defense of the city to be able to repel um, those who would come against the city because they would have nowhere to go. They're stuck on this glacis, uh, on this rampart, and uh, they're exposed to missile attacks and you know, bows and arrows and slings and, and javelins and other weapons. Um, there was a spatial sacred uh, set of buildings that were constructed in area BB. And then the final stratum, stratum 10, contained the oldest palace dis discovered at Megiddo. So we clearly have royal activity going on at Megiddo. If not earlier, then in stratum 10, we know it's there because of this um, this palace that was found. Now we move into the Late Bronze Age 1A, 1560 to 1450, and of course this is the period right before the Israelite Exodus in 1446 BC. So what's going on at the site? Well, this is really important. Um, Stratum 9's palace was renovated and enlarged so the people are becoming even more wealthy and the king is becoming greater and greater, that's clear. There's what's called bichrome wear. That's a kind of ceramics where you have two colors that are painted on the outside of it. Um, and they appear in great quantity in stratum 9. Sometimes bichrome wear reflects um, foreign pottery. So that could be um, trade that takes place with um, wealthier uh, people of other parts of the world, such as the Aegean. Or it could be uh, bichrome uh, wear that's made locally. Well, during this time, the king of Kadesh led a rebellion against Thutmose III, and he rallied his troops at Megiddo. 
So there was a rebellion against the Egyptian monarch, and it was put on by the king of Kadesh, and that king um, rallied his forces at Megiddo, and he expected there would be a battle against the Egyptian army. And sure enough, that's exactly what would happen. This occurred during year 5 of Thutmose III in uh, 1484 B.C. Um, uh, as on May 11th, he gathered his war council at uh, Yehem. And, um, and then spurring the Tanakh and Jokneum passes, he chose the Aruna Pass and its narrow route. So what happened was... Um, Thutmose III, he came from Egypt with his army, and they came up the International Highway, up the uh, Great Trunk Road. And as they got um, to this point here, near Yehem, he had a choice. He could send his army through the Tanakh Pass, through the Jokneam Pass, or through the Aruna Pass. And what he did is he sent um, portions of his army this way, and the, the defenders of Megiddo and, and the coalition that had joined here, they had their troops here uh, defending the Tanakh Pass and the Jokneam Pass. But they didn't really guard the Aruna Pass too much because they knew that that was a difficult and dangerous, very narrow pass. And what happened is uh, the night before they, the Egyptians were going to go in uh, and attack the army, Thutmose III met with his generals and he had a consultation. And his generals recommended to him that he not take that central pass because of its dangers. So what he did is he decided to spurn their advice. And he, he had uh, the majority of his army snuck through the Aruna Pass as, as the, um, the enemy were, were uh, in waiting for his move through the other two passes. So he was able then to, to, um, to essentially cut their armies in half, half on this side and half on this side, and really um, um, engage um, strategically in battle with them. The annals of Thutmose III at Karnak say, he who captures Megiddo captures a thousand cities. Why do they say that? Because Thutmose III conquered this co coalition led by the king of Kadesh, and he took over all of the flow of uh, movement, trade, and so forth going through the land of Israel through um, Canaan, and he um, he ca he captured Megiddo and he controlled it from this point, and now he was able to put a squeeze on all of the kings of um, the the uh, the southern Levant, and he knew how valuable the city of Megiddo was. Um, so, um, if you control Megiddo, the idea is. It's as if you control a thousand cities, because controlling Megiddo meant that you are limiting the the movement of people through from Asia to Africa, and they're at your mercy. They have to pass by you, and if you're not ready to let them through, then you know they're in big trouble. So Thutmose the Third gained a huge advantage by capturing the site of Megiddo. Now we're going to move into the Late Bronze II uh, period, but actually there's a, an overlap here, the, uh, the Late Bronze I-B and then Late Bronze IIa. And this is roughly from 1450 to 1305 B.C. So this is the latter part of um, Late Bronze Age I-B and then into IIa. This is a picture of what's left of the Late Bronze Age gate that would have been in use at the time. According to Joshua 12, Megiddo was conquered by Israelites. And here's what the text says. Now these are the kings of the land whom Joshua and the sons of Israel defeated beyond the Jordan, meaning to the east, uh, I'm sorry, to the west of the Jordan River, toward the west. And then it gives a list of kings. So this is what we, what we refer to in ancient Near Eastern studies as a king list, demonstrating not only this, the king that was conquered, but representing the king representing the city that was conquered. So it's all, it's a grocery list of cities, and then we come down to dot, 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 the king of Megiddo, and then dot, 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 and there are more. So Megiddo is one of the sites that was captured by the Israelites under Joshua. It's just that the Israelites didn't choose to live there immediately after they conquered the city um, sometime between 
1406 and 1400 BC, because that's the time of the conquest. Yet, and the Bible says in Joshua 17, yet the sons of Manasseh could not take possessions of these cities because the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. So the Israelites chose not to further uh, push the issue and try to take the land fully from the Canaanites. They could have, maybe even they should have, but they chose not to. So because they chose not to, the Canaanites persisted in the land, and they became essentially a thorn in the flesh for the Israelites. The Israelites just did not completely rid them from the land like they were instructed by God. They were told that they should um, um, wipe out the Canaanites completely. There's a palace here and a city gate here in stratum 8. The palace of stratum 10 uh, from an earlier stratum was enlarged and enclosed in a wall and continued in use until the end of stratum 7a. And its identity as a palace is confirmed by the rich hoard of jewelry and carved ivories that were found in the structure in stratum 8 and stratum 7a. And we'll look at a few of those examples soon. Um, this rich treasury included ivory plaques, boxes, so beautiful boxes actually, as well as golden vessels, jewelry, and beads of gold and lapis lazuli um, that were hidden in a floor, um, beneath the floor, of a small um, set of rooms at the northern end of the palace. And according to Aharoni, this is clear indication of a great wealth of the kings of Megiddo in the Amarna age. And so now we're talking about the 1300s BC, the 14th century. Here is what's known as the Megiddo ivory box, and you can see how ornately carved this piece of ivory was. It had to be a massive tusk, probably an elephant's tusk that was used, and they fashioned um, mythological creatures flying here with wings. So um, absolutely gorgeous and would have been very expensive. And then there's this very important piece here. Uh, the enthroned king of Megiddo, and he is sitting on his throne right there, is attended by two females, um, one serving a lotus, this one here, and the other playing a lyre, and there she is playing that lyre right there. So it's a musical instrument. Um, a soldier armed with a shield and spear right here leads two bound nude prisoners. And so here are the prisoners. You can see their arms are tied behind their back. And as was the custom in the ancient world, their elbows were connected. That's how they were held as captives. It's not like nowadays where handcuffs are in the front and you can kind of, the prisoner can do what he wants. Um, in the ancient world, there wouldn't have been such um, ability. Um, so these prisoners uh, were joined by a rope to the chariot team. So this charioteer essentially is leading these captives um, who are bound at the arms and elbows. Uh, the prisoners are bearded. You can see the beards here of the prisoners. Uh, and by the way, the Israelites wore beards. Um, and they wear their hair up in two loops on top of their heads. And whether you can tell or not, these men are circumcised. So, most likely, this is a depiction of the king of Megiddo being presented with captives. What kind of captives? Naked, circumcised people. This either dates to uh, the Amarna period or shortly after the Amarna period. Very likely, these are two Israelite captives who are being depicted here. So this shows that the conflict that was taking place between the Israelites and the Canaanites at this period in time. And we see this very thing in the Amarna letters, which are found in Egypt under the reign of Akhenaten and date to the 14th century, the middle of the 14th century BC, where there's constant conflicts described between the, the, um, the rulers of the cities, of the city-states in Canaan, versus these people that are called the Habiru. And of course, Habiru is the Akkadian word that's the equivalent of Hebrew and is the equivalent of the Egyptian Apiru. So these almost certainly, uh, in the Amarna letters, these Habiru are Hebrews who are fighting against uh, the, the uh, petty kings in Canaan, jo jostling for control 
um, in the region. So this probably is depicting Israelites on this um, beautiful ivory plaque. Um, here are several of the Amarna letters, and they talk about the um, conflict that's going on, such as Amarna letter 242 that says, Say to the king, my lord and my son, message from Biradiah, the ruler of Megiddo. So the ruler of Megiddo is one who instructs a certain scribe to be writing a letter that's sent then down to Egypt, and the king of Egypt um, deals with whatever is written. Message from Birdaya, um, the loyal servant of the king. I fall at the feet of the king, Lord, and my son, and my God, seven times and seven times. I have obeyed the orders of the king, my lord and my son, and I am indeed guarding Megiddo, the city of the king. And as the warring of the Apiru in the land is severe, may the king take cognizance of his land. So right there is a reference to a conflict between the king of Megiddo and the Apiru, or Habiru, who are in the land of Canaan, fighting them for control. So this is a complete tie-in to what we see on this beautiful ivory Megiddo plaque. Almost certainly contemporaneous or nearly con contemporaneous in time and reflecting the same reality that's going on. Okay, so now we're going to move down in time with the time we have remaining to look into the Iron Age 2A, approximately 1000 to 841 BC. Stratum 5B was follow, uh, followed stratum 6A, which followed stratum 7A, the initial occupation phase of the Iron Age. Stratum 5B probably was the first Israelite occupational phase and began after David destroyed Megiddo of stratum 6A, as the final city of the Iron Age I was destroyed by a fierce conflagration. And of course, that is a destruction by a massive fire. So somebody came and destroyed the city and then lit it on fire to finish the job of destroying it. Megiddo of Stratum 5b, as with Stratum 6a before it, possessed no city wall and its structures reflect a state of material scarcity. So Stratum 5b is not wealthy people. It's not people who are able to defend themselves uh, and they don't even build a uh, protective city wall. Based on the limited pottery, Yigal Shiloh ascribed this level to the Israelites of the first half of the 10th century BC. And we know where that fits in biblical history very well because David, uh, King David, who's already been king of Judah, in 1002 BC, at the death of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, who was king, um, he takes over as king of all of Israel. He conquers Jerusalem in the same year, in 1002 BC, and his reign goes until um, he dies in about um, 969, I think, is the year that he dies. But in 971, Solomon um, st steps onto the throne, and Solomon rules from 971 B.C. all the way down to 931 B.C. So stratum 5b is dealing with that period of time, uh, especially the, the end of David's reign and, and the whole reign of Solomon and into the subsequent reign or two. So let me backtrack here. Stratum 4b is, is that early stratum in the Israelite possession that would have been around um, in David's lifetime and then early into Solomon's reign going down to about 950 B.C. Then stratum 5a to 4b is, all, is in the Iron Age 2a. That's starting in the reign of Solomon. Albright and Wright pointed out that the University of Chicago structures of stratum 5a in the north of the mound and the structures of stratum 4b in the south date to the same period. According to Shiloh, pottery, cultic shrines, stone-horned altars, and various other artifacts of stratum 5a, 4b all date to the 10th century, to the time of uh, Solomon's reign. Now, not everybody agrees with this assessment. For example, Israel Finkelstein, the Israeli scholar and archaeologist, is convinced that this stratum belongs later in time because he doesn't want to see a united, strong united monarchy in Israel. Um, 1 Kings 9.15 says that Megiddo is one of the cities or one of the places that Solomon built up. So Solomon built up Megiddo, and we see that um, in the form of this um, uh, post-Solomonic city wall that's built on top of building, I'm sorry, 
This is the post-Solomonic city wall here that's built on top of this palace from Solomon's time, uh, building 1723. 1723. Um, this is the Israelite gate that's in the area, so Solomon would have constructed um, the gate that's in this area. This is uh, the University of Chicago's drawing of this city gate. It's a six-chambered gate. And, um, and the six-chambered gate itself would have been built um, under the rule of Solomon. So it demonstrates a re reflection of this actual uh, fortification that took place during his reign with Megiddo being one of the sites um, that he fortified. So this is uh, the Solomonic gate of um, 4B5A. And, um, and then later uh, forms of the gate were not six-chambered. They were four-chambered and then two-chambered, so uh, the dimensions uh, lessened over time rather than expanded. So certainly during Solomon's time, we have massive construction taking place. And there are stables here also in stratum 4A that could relate to Solomon's uh, time period and later, um, such as this um, part of the stable that dates to probably the reign of King Ahab. So um, Megiddo would have been a place where horses were kept, and the horses reflect the chariots and the uh, cavalry that Solomon had and, and subsequent uh, kings um, of, of Israel and Judah. And, and so um, uh, they were kept in these stalls or stables here. And then our, for our final slide, this is... Um, a close-up view of one of the stables. So this probably would have been the equivalent of a post where you would tie the horse to, to this and then the horse would be contained within this area. So that's part of the excavation that was done at the site of Megiddo and it reflects um, the, um, uh, the events of biblical history and what took place during the reign of some of the kings including David and Solomon at Megiddo such as the construction of the monumental architecture and the building up of the city of Megiddo one of the important sites in ancient Israel that guarded the uh, movement of traffic through the, um, uh, and along the Great Trunk Road. And so this site is very important in Israel's history. And during the, the period of Isra Israelites' um, monarchy, it was um, of sub substantial importance. All right, we'll see you in our next lesson when we go further into um, the sites that reflect biblical history and give us an understanding of how we can connect biblical archaeology with the text of the Bible to understand what's to be understood with it to a greater degree. See you next time.